Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and this time we're back on to good old digital electronics but I thought we'd really go back to basics and look at uh, exactly what CMOS is and what it means um, and it's a word that occurs a great deal around the electronics world so let's see if we can actually create some CMOS circuits of our own using discrete components. Okay before we look at the um, CMOS principles. Let's start with a quick refresher on the devices we're going to be encountering today. So we've got the N channel MOSFET and the P channel MOSFET. I've included an N and a P on these uh, just to make it easy to identify which is which. We're going to be seeing quite a lot of these um, uh, so we think it just makes life a little bit easier just to include the, the letter to save you having to uh, do a, a mental jump each time to remember which is which and then miss out on perhaps some of the bits that uh, that are more important. So connections, drain, gate and source, um, same for both. Source is always the one that's got the arrow on it. And just to note again, um, you can see all this in my MOSFET video if you uh, want to look at the detail. Um, recommend you perhaps do have a look at that. Uh, the gate is not directly connected to the drain or the source and its influence uh, on the behaviour of the drain and source is done entirely electrostatically so uh, there is no current um, fl flowing uh, through the gate connection at any point. It's purely voltage control. Okay so uh, to turn on an N channel MOSFET we take the gate more positive relative to the source and to turn on um, a P channel MOSFET we take the gate voltage negative relative to the source so it's simply the inverse of the other. Now the C bit of CMOS, the complementary, comes from the notion of um, getting these transistors to work in pairs so here's a little grab from the TI data sheet for a 4011 which is a quad uh, NAND gate and you can hopefully see there if we look at the top left we've got a P channel and directly underneath it an N channel MOSFET and indeed if you work your way across the diagram you'll see each MOSFET um, is got a complementary N for its P or a P for its N depending uh, how you want to uh, to say all that. So that's the, um, the general arrangement of um, the MOSFETs and the, the complementary bit. Uh, NAND gates slightly more complicated so we'll, we'll come back to NAND gates but let's uh, let's start with something a little more simple see if we can get that to work. So what we're going to do is an inverter or a NOT gate if you like the truth table being when the input is high the output should be low when the input is low the output should be high so it's n the output is NOT the input if you like. Um, circuit then incredibly simple uh, simply two MOSFETs P at the top and at the bottom in on the left out on the right and we've got supply at the top um, ground at the bottom and the way the circuit works again incredibly straightforward if we take the input high uh, that will turn on the N channel MOSFET effectively connecting the output to ground so that will be low if we take the input low that will switch off the N channel but it will turn on the P channel effectively connecting the output to, to positive um, and obviously there's the ability for the uh, the output there to uh, to source or to sync some current which um, is handy and we'll, we'll make use of that so that we can uh, we can see what's going on in the circuit. Now I'm going to include um, another component uh, but if you look at that circuit one transistor is on the other transistor is always off uh, so it's not possible for positive to be connected to negative at any point except potentially during the transition so I'm going to include a 330 ohm resistor just as a current limiting device so I don't um, destroy my lovely MOSFETs I don't expect to but I'm working on a breadboard and if I do uh, make a bit of a mistake and get either of those transistors in a, a transitional state there is the potential for considerable current to flow so that resistor will simply limit that current to uh, about 15 milliamps or something like that so um, hopefully won't destroy anything. Um, the MOSFETs I'm using are the BS250 for the P channel and the 2N7000 for the N channel. No reason really other than I had the 2N7000s and the BS250s are a, a sort of a complementary device. Um, both come in the same sort of package and uh, look identical apart from the identification numbers. Okay, so onto the arrangement on the breadboard then, and again, 
mind-bogglingly simple two transistors and uh, a 330 ohm resistor you can see there uh, the way I've got this arranged the P channels at the bottom the N channels at the top so that's the opposite way around to the schematic uh, that doesn't matter other than um, I thought I'd better just include it if you can um, copy this uh, exactly so there we go input the white wire on the left output the sort of bluey purple uh, wire uh, just below the N channel device there moving off to the right so without further ado let's hop across to the bench and see if we can get this circuit to actually uh, do what it says on the tin. Okay so here's the circuit set out as uh, you've just seen in the uh, on the slides. Uh, got the gate here, um, input side and output side so I'm going to apply power now just 5 volts and uh, the only additions to the circuit diagram that I've shown you are the indicating LED so I've got a, a, a resistor here which is tying the input side high uh, and that push button when pressed will take the input side low so that's sort of working the wrong way around in one sense but you can see the state of the input at the moment it's high with that LED lit and on the output side I've got another LED which is connected to the output on that grey wire and that um, resistor there is just a current limiting resistor to um, allow the LED to not uh, to not run away and destroy itself. So operation is incredibly simple. Um, in fact it's working now. We've got input high, inversion means output is low. So if we press this button and take the input low, we instantly get this LED lit. So we're now low, high, loose it, um, reverse it so you can see we have inversion going on there yeah. okay so I've reconfigured the circuit just ever so slightly so I've removed the push button switch from here and I've now replaced it with a, an input from a, a function generator and I'm going to produce um, 5 volt um, square wave pulses um, so currently I've got the signal generator off I'll switch it on and uh, We've got only got a one hertz pulse, so we can see rather nicely there. We've got every time the input goes high there, we get the lit LED, and I've obviously got the converse going on um, because the the gate is doing inversion as we've already demonstrated. Uh, but what I want to do next involves increasing the frequency to the point that um, the LEDs will start to make um, not a lot of sense. You see, even at five hertz it's becoming increasingly difficult to decide I mean you, you can see that they are flashing alternately but if I now increase that to 10 Hertz it's difficult now to, to be a hundred percent certain they are doing that or they are doing that but um, <laughs> it's very difficult to see and certainly at 50 Hertz which is the main frequency here in the UK uh, you can pretty much they appear to be on solid down at 40 you can de down at 40 hertz there you can detect something but certainly at 50 you can't and 60 which I know um, certainly for the, the Americas is their frequency you certainly can't see it there so what I'm now going to do is up it to um, considerably more than that I'm actually going to up it to 10 megahertz so we've now got the um, uh, the inversion going on uh, 10 million times a second now bear in mind this is just on a breadboard it's not got any um, clever ground planes or anything like that to get rid of interference so it's not ideal uh, but let's have a look at uh, the input and the output on an oscilloscope so here is the scope view the yellow trace is the incoming pulse the green trace is the outgoing pulse and you can see we have indeed got inversion going on there but what I now want to do is I want to zoom in um, in terms of uh, time to actually have a look at the transition and if we if we go from just to show you we've got a time base there of 20 microseconds per division let's now zoom in and really have a look at that transition there that's at 20 nanoseconds uh, so I've moved in three orders of magnitude you can see the uh, this is the generating generators pulse changing and this is the response and what you can see there is uh, there is um, a little propagation delay that's something you often see, me see mentioned on uh, 
on manufacturer spec, spec sheets so this is the uh, response of the gate uh, how quickly it can respond and okay we we probably could argue about exactly where you start taking the measurements but what you can see is the main slope is definitely um, further to the right on the output than it is um, it, it's not in line with the left hand one so there is uh, a response time for the two um, FETs to uh, MOSFETs to switch uh, on and off depending on uh, which state it is and if I up that a little more you can see yeah that's at 10 nanoseconds so I'll come back to 20 and let's just increase the, the frequency a little so I'm going to go up to um, uh, that's uh, as high as the um, signal generator will go that's uh, that's 80 megahertz and you can hopefully see that um, sorry that's 80 kilohertz let's let's up it to let's try in uh, fact I'm apologies I'm getting completely mixed up uh, so that's at one megahertz now and there hasn't been really much change there has there to be quite honest let's um, let's go up to 10 and you can see we, we are definitely starting to struggle there the things breaking down but certainly up to about that that's two megahertz so at two megahertz uh, it's still working absolutely fine I'm sure a, a great deal of this has got to do with the fact that I'm just working on a breadboard which isn't ideal by any stretch of the imagination so you can see the pro propagation delay um, at one megahertz there so what we'll now do is we'll go back to um, let's go back to 10 kilohertz which is actually where I was uh, before apologies for knocking the camera there um, so back on, onto the oscilloscope trace again so if I so we can see we've got um, te, we've got 10 kilohertz there now um, and now what I'm going to do is add uh, a third trace in so let's just uh, what I'm going to do is reduce the vertical scale on these two channels because we don't actually need um, we just need to see um, when the time is occurring and I'm going to just move those up the screen like so and now I'm going to switch on channel 3 which is across the um, resistor that's attached to the two um, FETs and uh, w first thing to note is you've got quite a different scale here this is 500 millivolts per division whereas the other ones are 5 volts per division so it's a tenth difference so I'm just going to move that down a little bit and now what I want to do is zoom in again on the time scale and I want to just show you in fact I'm going to move the exposition across there so we can really just have a, a close look at this so so what you've got here now on the yellow trace is the signal generator transitioning from low to high the gate responding by going from high to low but this is what's happening to the voltage across the uh, resistor that is the current limiting resistor for the two FETs and um, I'm sure somebody far cleverer than me will, will be along to explain all this um, but that is the uh, obviously difficult to measure current here so I'm just measuring voltage across a, a resistor but you can see that although the I suppose those um, do represent um, there is some sort of correspondence to that there uh, I suppose if we increase that scale 10 times you'd see it but this this is the um that's the point where there is potential for for both transistors to be to be partially on or off and of course there's an increased amount of current i accept it is um very small indeed but nonetheless that's um that's what we're seeing and uh, if we now go back out again we can hopefully see that the uh, we've got inversion going on and certainly even on something as simple as this on a breadboard it's it's quite capable of, of operating up to to around one megahertz without um, too much of a problem so there we are we've created ourselves a, a CMOS not gate okay well there you have a uh, real live CMOS not gate created from discrete components um, quite enjoyed doing that um, and it's interesting to see uh, the, the way the FETs respond and even on a breadboard they're able to to respond in in the uh, the sort of the megahertz region without uh, without too much problem so uh, i enjoyed doing that hopefully uh, you found it useful um now 
right at the very beginning when I was uh, talking through the theory I showed the circuit of a of a NAND gate um, which is a little bit more complicated and I don't have enough FETs to create uh, the 4011 NAND gate but I'm hoping I can uh, do something similar so that's what part two is going to be about we're going to um, build on what we've done uh, in this video and see if we can create a, a CMOS NAND gate so hopefully uh, you'll uh, you'll turn up to watch that one be great if you could thanks very much for watching see you soon